So, once again, talking about the Carolingians. Hmm? Talking about the Carolingian Empire specifically and the role of um, the public officials uh, in their uh, beneficia, so their, their literally their benefits, so what was given and trusted to them by the, uh, by the kings uh, to, to control the territory and to administrate it. <coughs> in, in, in the place of the king, which is a very important topic because it's basically the key to understand the whole Carolingian um, system of uh, administrative system, but not only because it has huge implications in politics, um, in, 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 in military affairs, and more generally in, in, in the same um, composition of the Carolingian Empire. Um, because there was no thing like a uh, real bureaucracy at this time, there wasn't a state as we, we mean it modernly. So uh, what we have um, from this point of view is definitely um, the, the, the skeleton of the same uh, Carolingian Empire and how it worked and much of you know how eventually things went. Um, <laughs> firstly, you know, and most importantly, the, the same decline and disgregation of the Carolingian Empire, uh, as well as its, uh, at its formation at the beginning, has to be interpreted uh, through, through this. And um, as you know, um, you know, w I'm going to talk about the so-called vassalatic and beneficiary system. Mm -hmm. I would like to to make a bit um, to make uh, a bit the, the term clear because um, I realize I, I never found really this term on the internet at least in English. Not that I have been even searching much <laughs> to the truth, but uh, very often uh, when when I read you know being talking about talk about the, the Carolingian Empire, I see uh, the expression feudalism. Mm. Uh, you know the idea that feudalism was born um, since the time of the Carolingian Empire. Well, surely the mm, the system as such, you know, the idea that the um, that we often talk about of a king giving this piece of land um, <coughs> to uh, to a noble in order to administrate it um, in 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 his name by getting an income from that same um property is indeed the base of what feudalism would have would have become uh but let's say that the term feudalism in itself is um recalls um much more what happened in the low and especially late middle ages um uh, you know in this idea of formalization of a system that was otherwise very dynamic uh, especially during even still during the low middle ages and that at this stage um, of, of medieval history in the High Middle Ages during the Carolingian Empire was something um <coughs> still even more fluid mm, because especially in the Carolingian Empire and uh, as a Frankish Empire in practice uh, there was still the, um, the very peculiar Frankish characteristic of thinking of these um, huge dominion as essentially something private, something personal that belonged to the ruling dynasty. This is something that had been set by the Merovingians and that the Carolingians inherited uh, essentially by, by a right of, uh, of force and reinforcing it. Um <coughs> so at that time theoretically speaking was w very strong and alive the idea that um no matter how much uh, land the 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 king or emperor would give to his uh, aristocracy to rule the the um, the same dominions, but that land belonged to to the king, um, and therefore the term vassalatic and beneficiary was definitely is better the, the best term to to define it because it stresses the role of the vassus that was this man that basically made an act of fealty and obedience to the king and got this beneficium hence beneficiary um, to eventually return uh, the king. Um, then we know that, that, that uh, even uh, in, in the late Carolingian Empire there were 
there was a sort of formalization um, uh, for you know basically uh, creating not a, 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 a real inheritance of this uh, beneficia from uh, father to son but the idea that if the king wasn't there because maybe he had gone to war or he 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 had died and stuff um these um this property could mm, in that moment pass into the hands of uh, of someone that was preferably the, the, the major son according to the, the germanic tradition um but it it was still a moment in which the uh let's say the the the, the strong ideological idea that whatever was on the soil of Francia and to the subjected to the other subjected kingdoms and lands and peoples belonged effectively to the king um <coughs> as a person mm. um which is um um you know really a halfway between not just a private but also public a way of um, you know shaping this empire, and I think that one of the major characteristics that we will be seeing now about the Carolingian Empire, that through which you can read it um, for for all its history, is this um, effort that the Carolingians made to create a, s a you know something more public um, than what their predecessors had had mm, had created. Uh, not to take away their own, you know, the power from their their own Carolingian family, but on the contrary, to create structures that would be somehow um <coughs> more resistant um, uh, over time, not because they belonged privately to someone, but because be they were a sort of public good. Mm. I, I already made a video that explains the role of the Carolingian church in, into this process and how you know the at a certain point the Carolingians uh, sort of bet on you know and on you know the the bond with the church to say let's entrust churchmen uh, more land so that because of their of of their um, um, in, in, in you know um, immunities um, this land can be, um, you know, preserved by other uh, private, uh, by private uh, owners, and which which is a bit ambiguous because, as we have seen, clergymen were still partly from from the same families from the from which the the, the, arist the Frankish aristocracy uh, was essentially, um, but uh, you know, trying to strengthen something that went beyond the um the usual personal uh bond of uh, of fealty that was just eventually uh, sanctioned by by name so in factual terms other things could could happen and and, and really happen in Carolingian history um and um and, and it's something in which the Carolingians substantially failed paradoxically it was the church that eventually um got the the uh the most from it because in fact the church being something public at least in 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 the christian sense of the world and and especially very being very differentiated from this um this um you know personal bondage between aristocratic laymen um <coughs> would survive um, and and so um, her lands and her assets are normally defended even by that last uh, gleaming of 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 public power that existed in in, in the in the lay world um, and parts of of, of the things uh, actually much of of this process actually started from the same Carolingian Empire even though the church obviously already had before certain uh beneficia and and uh, immunities uh but what i wanted to talk about today is the strictly public um uh, fort of the carolingians to create uh, uh, a centralized administration or at least something that you know it sounds a bit a paradox it wasn't centralized because it was given to people who eventually would were all 
um, but central, uh, even in the same physical uh, meaning of the word, spatial f meaning of the word, since they were scattered all over the the the, the Carolingian Empire. But let's say this idea that I in a certain way that there there had to be a sort of public centralized asset, but with with a personal bondage, which uh, which is in fact a paradox, and that's the same <laughs> reason for which um, it, it eventually didn't work, and uh, the Carolingian Empire uh, collapsed. And you can immediately understand that. Um, these huge royal domains that made up the world Carolingian Empire were uh, couldn't be easy to to control because they're in fact uh, entrusted to these um, these clientele um, that was essentially an armed uh, aristocracy tied to to the king that um, um, that was by the same sovereign distributed uh, within the, the same kingdom through the vassalatic beneficiary system that we we briefly exposed a short while ago and uh, and at the same time however you find next to these uh, um, private um, um, private um, clientels um, an effort to create public officials. Think at the famous Missi Dominici, so the the the, uh, the Lord's envoys, um, in this case the King's envoys, that that were also remunerated uh, with uh, fiscal um, with fiscal rights, and that uh, ha therefore had the tendency to eradicate in, in the province to which they were assigned and in which obviously they, they received these mm, um, they, they could they could enjoy these rights um, and, um, and and the point is this is that w which difference was there <laughs> between the, 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 the clientele the private clientele of the king and these public officials mm? and, and the question is you know how did the Carolingians and their own successors eventually even chose their own uh, officials? <laughs> well, the answer is that they were the same people because the uh, the public officials were chosen uh, within the same aristocratic aristocratic clientele uh, from which the king, um, uh, through which the king uh, entrusted. Um, the um, the royal properties to through the beneficia and, um, and 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 therefore um, uh, you you see that these public officials the s in the Carolingian Empire were chosen within the, the the most prestigious vassals or even among other friend um, power uh, you know friendly um, men of power, so even people who were outside maybe the clientele and were maybe part of, uh, of a client state instead, like the ones in which the Carolingian Empire extended its power, um, who um, by obtaining this public power, um, so this public office, um, uh, sworn a, a, a vassalatic fealty. So you see that in practice, between the members of these, mm, you know, wealthy parental groups of the aristocracy, who were already tied to the royal court by blood bonds or mm, matrimonial contracts or other forms of familiarity, um, uh, there, there was a very different, uh, there, there was a very uh, inexistent difference. Uh, with public officials. And and the interesting point from this point of view is that uh, <laughs> these vassals um, uh, were, by the way, the, the most dangerous threat to the same Carolingian authority, meaning that uh, this is another paradox, um, because um, these vassals, in, in spite of what the Carolingians could give them, already had 
very large estates. Mm -hmm. So they they had a genetic tendency towards autonomy that um, that was suggested by their wealth. And 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 by the way, um, they 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 were dangerous for the ro for royal power in a in a very wide uh, historical and political perspective because these people um, were essentially um, in, in large numbers the same aristocrats that existed uh, all over the, the, the Frankish Empire even before the, the Carolingians eventually um, took, took power. So uh, w they, they normally maybe at the point their ancestors had even had even been against um the Carolingians when uh, when they were um at the beginning of their of their expansion uh, within the same frankish um within uh, within the same frankish kingdom and and yet at the same time in order to control the lands that that very often were were s they still inhabited um the um the king would uh you know basically um reconfirm this condition of theirs and to to, to reinvigorate it um through the um through the concession so a, a royal concession of this public office mm -hmm. um and and as you understand from here you can't really understand how what what, what was what was wrong in the Carolingian Empire at its core that as long as the king could could entrust these people with offices and keep them you know fine especially during the moments of expansion in which these guys could you know get not just by participating with the king get powered court and and therefore within the same Frankish Empire but they could even conquer other lands maybe of other peoples that they could be entrusted of by the king eventually uh, they they would be uh, essentially faithful to the king they would honor their their oath of fealty but after that you know they were a big problem and they were a hell of a problem because they were the same guys who eventually through always the same clientele so maybe were moved by the same Carolingian family that at every generation split up dominions between the, uh, the, the, the various sons uh, they would push for the disintegration of the same uh, Carolingian Empire um, for getting their uh, original for regaining their original autonomy and building up their own in turn their own um, political uh, and, and military missions and therefore expanding their dominions um, once again and this is basically what happened in the Carolingian Empire that's the reason why the Carolingian Empire collapsed similarly to the Roman Empire basically the, 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 the Carolingian Empire had been overstretched it couldn't be realistically uh, further expanded and therefore the Franks turned to f fight against each other again and they definitely had resources to do so thanks exactly to this system that had kept feeding um, ar the aristocracy within the same uh, empire without creating a, a, a proper statal public structure mm. and, and therefore you know <laughs> having to, to restart from zero um, at a certain point f uh, in terms of building a uh, public power um, and, um, and and therefore if you see this compenetration between the public order and the vassalatic bene beneficiary structures um, you can see that uh, within the same course of the Carolingian age um, it became extremely frequent the concession the conception according to which the public office mm, in the provinces in which the Carolingian Empire was made up uh, was it I in itself the same beneficium that was con that was granted to um, uh, 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 to a vassal by the king and therefore from 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 this point onwards the beneficium was not only called like um, 
the group of fiscal goods uh, that was assigned um, to account to, to, to be administrated. But the, the same function of this public office was entrusted to the count as a military chief and a judge of the same province. So basically in, in these cases it, it was as if mm, it, they, they came to, to mean as beneficium the same service that through uh, the sa uh, same beneficium it had to be compensated. Because obviously these offices were meant to 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 fee to I mean to to, f to be rewarded through themselves through the the um, the the same goods that, that they uh, that they could produce and, and and all of this is is comprehensible of course um, by considering the the increase of the social pr prestige that these mm, offices mm, basically implicated um, and. Um, and 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 also especially the economic adva advantages that were directly connected to the um, concrete exercise of the same of the same office and think about the the uh, the fodrum, the foraging rights hmm? you know the idea that uh, uh, that at a certain point during um, um, the, the, you know the, the the king would require, you know, mm, a certain amount of food to for for, it, for the logistics of its army. Well, uh, this was basically administered by a local count, would would surely help the king, but also g getting, uh, you know, its own supplies and stocks, maybe for its own I military ambitions, or even think uh, about the fines that were that were uh, that were related to the exercise of justice that was an extremely rem remunerative um, exercise at that time uh, of which obviously the counts uh, retained a large part because the the the, uh, the, the penalties that, that came from from the administration of justice, normally were paid normally both um, both to the the people who had been um, who had been um, whose rights had been in infringed as a compensation, but a part would also go to the to the public officials and and in this case to the same counts so to these counts slash officials that they had turned to be. Um, and this tells you how, you know, how weak really within the Carolingian Empire was the concept of public good. This is not really a problem that you can't really blame the Franks so much for, meaning that um, this mindset was really in, 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 in Central and Northern Europe was uh, had always been there, you know, since it was a Germanic tradition and, and it was extremely difficult to these people um, creating something similar to a, 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 a startled public structure like instead in Southern Europe even the same Romano-Germanic kingdoms had been tried. The Longobards instead had a very, um, a very strong culture of public, um, of, 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 of the public of a public authority. Um, the Visigoths uh, had failed, but basically the, the when the Carolingians invaded Italy especially and they saw how things worked in, in the Longobard lands and, and as well as in the Byzantine dominions that in part the same Longobards had just um, a short time before conquered, they realized that the answer for the problems that afflicted the, 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 the Frankish world from this point of view was creating a state like in the Roman fashion of, of the term and, and and they tried to export it in, into the Frankish lands they, they tried but here you see that this, the public officials that they 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 uh, that, that they created uh, were you know th the intent was good the intention was really good but 
the the uh, the, lo the Frankish aristocracy was so strong and so powerful in 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 actual terms because they were rich. They had the clientels on their own, even even if the king hadn't de given them already. And and the same reason for which the Carolingians emerged in the first place was this acceptance. You know, the acceptance that that these aristocracies had to remain in place in a certain sense because what really could the Carolingians do if they had not um, absorbed and, and, and favored aristocracies under their command. The Carolingians didn't emerge from the Frankish world because they were the, the, the strongest warriors. They emerged because yeah they were great commanders, very skilled in battle, but th the very reason is that they fueled their expansion by letting our people join in them. And without these people they would have never made it. So at the peak of the Carolingian power, at the time of Charles the Great, at the time of Louis the Pius, uh, these great two, these two great monarchs understood that if the system had, if the, if the system had to to exist in some way, they had to create um, a, a public structure, a saddle structure that would be separated from these um these uh, extremely complicated net and 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 tangle of uh, of 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 quarrelsome aristocracies that all wanted to you know to to emerge at court and sh and having their their share of the cake of the empire um and and and, and yet they they couldn't they couldn't achieve that because first of all succession problems became immediately to to kick in at every generation but especially there wasn't I in the Frankish world and and not even among the aristocracies that were beyond uh, north of the Alps the the culture the the culture that that could allow something different from a a personal bond uh, a personal clientary system to exist and um, and it's very important to understand. It's not even a matter of Frankish, uh, the Frankish culture in itself. I, I I I just said it. It was a matter of, of all the people we inhabited at that point. It was the problem was that there hadn't been a solid statal structure, um, or at least an experiment of statalism north of the Alps after the end of the Roman Empire. These peoples had been living with the uh, with the traditional idea that uh, that that it was all a personal bondage um th th their you know power stemmed from the um from the the lineage well this is something maybe too too anachronistic for this time because the idea of lineage was something developed later even with the strengthening of these vassal aristocracies you and and uh, but let's say the idea that uh, the 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 authority and social prestige derived not from a public order and from participating to it but from a personal valor that could be you know and it was mostly obviously based on 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 on, on power on money on on estates um and 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 the Carolingians, in spite of their, you know, m uh, r really praiseable efforts and intelligence, that couldn't enforce in this world, uh, even f for a simple quantitative uh, resistance. I mean, it, it was impossible to impose it on, on that world. Um, it would be interesting, however, to see how the same Carolingians probably didn't even fully absorb the, the concept of, of statal public tradition. And you can't see this in Italy, because Italy was the only place where there was a structure like that, thanks to the Longobard kings that had shaped their own kingdom in, in, in a public fashion, without, n without never renouncing to their Germanic ethnical uh, traditions, even in law, but creating the idea of of a of a kingdom that worked independently from 
the existence of a particular king or, or a particular dynasty. And yet when the Carolingians came in Italy, the first thing they did in order also to control it was to give lands to, to, to private people, to the counts. Uh, in Italy a lot of, um, of um, northeastern Frenchmen <laughs> came to, to, beca to become progressively the um, the ruling class in the various uh, marches and duchies, um, obviously mixing with Longobards, but really you know ruling from the top and therefore imposing this much more um, personal conception of power and of authority that eventually made also the king the Longobard kingdom of Italy as it it was called even during the Carolingian time uh, into uh, a sort of um, a sweet generis um, Frankish emanation mm -hmm. even though you know yeah Italy always remained a bit different from the rest of I don't know France or Germany uh, but obviously there were big differences even within France or Germany. Um, but the idea is that the world north of the Alps was um, quite strongly uh, used to reason in, in private ter terms, to see uh, power as a private business. Uh, Italy um, mm, was very heavily influenced by it, but uh, there were there was even a, a different distribution of, of, of property, of wealth, that um, that made eventually the country developing in, a, in another fashion. And in fact, you see that even during the Middle Ages, feudalism in Italy, as an evolution of the ancient Basilatic beneficiary system, was generally weaker. I mean, it, it wasn't weaker by by quality, but it was dif uh, weaker by quantity, meaning that um, in Italy there, there weren't the the huge domains that you can find in France, for instance. And therefore also aristocracy played on other levels. There were cities and generally speaking uh, the situation remained quite different. Um, however, I think it's still important to understand, and especially I think that I made my point clear, that how the control of the Carolingian Empire, um, even true public officials couldn't, um, uh, c really couldn't do without the private um, Frankish aristocracy that eventually permeated the world, the world system, and and basically made uh unavoidably uh, failing the idea of creating a public office um uh, without entrusting it to someone who would use it essentially as a private um as a private beneficiary mm -hmm. uh, a private beneficiary i mean it had to be public as well because it at least belonged to the king originally but no the the uh, let's say that history took another path <laughs> and these guys so since the very beginning this beneficiary more as something private than something that at least belonged to, to the king uh, that had to be at the center. <sighs> okay, so we're talking a lot about the Carolingians. <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I'm no expert about the Carolingian world really, but um, I really think um, if you want to understand um, European history, at least from the Middle Ages, uh, from excuse me, from the High Middle Ages onwards, you have to understand uh, really this this passage because it, it's it's really where the mold was formed. How certain processes, no matter how they evolved, eventually were set there. Mm. And pre carolingian Europe was definitely something different, and we will have to talk uh, again and again about the Carolingians because. Uh, they really left a mark that can't be that can't be um, ignored, which it would and, and it's strange in my opinion how you know uh, I, I I hear so rarely mm, 
talking about the Carolingian, Carolingian history and, and especially about these dynamics, which are, should be really the ABC of medieval history and people don't even know they even took place. I think that mass culture about Middle Ages has been really um, taken over by fanboys and by you know the, 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 the cinematographic um, emotional uh, emotional um, trends I mean there is n really no concrete interest from 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 mass from popular culture to, to really understand how to study history in the first place and and the fact that if you want to understand the Middle Ages you necessarily have to pass through a solid starting of, of the whole Middle Ages. You can't make it a matter of uh, my, my country and, and nothing else. You have to reason and, and when you talk about the Carolingian Empire you have to understand that up to a certain point it was the largest thing that ever happened into the Western Middle Ages and uh, and that in a, in a certain way even those entities that weren't part of it like uh, but the, mm, like the Iberian Peninsula at least in, in for the major part the British islands the Scandinavian peoples and uh, the, the the Western Slavs were so heavily influenced by the Carolingian Empire which was a huge thing uh, not just in terms of territorial ex extension but in sheer s size and force, I mean, this central Europe was really, especially France, was uh, was the richest place in Europe. Let's be honest about it. In terms of quantity of goods, independently of you know how it eventually was distributed, because the same Carolingian world brought essentially the these local societies to be poor on average, meaning that there was one guy, who was the count, who had everything and all the other people had a very few. Um, but the, the, the whole Frankish machine, political and military machine, and all the consequences that, that it entailed every time that it moved, shaped the face of Europe. And you can't say, well, well but I lived across the channel, or <laughs> I don't know, I live in, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. It was so influential that, um, that you necessarily have to understand it. Mm. Um, especially the idea of, uh, I don't know, people are so keen on Vikings, but if you look at, at Central Europe in the same period, it, it's so much more complex and fascinating and and it's so much so better documented and you, you understand from that that it's that the normal people interests are only pushed by by rationality forgive me the vent <laughs> this time but certain things have to be said because you d you can't even understand viking history if you don't know carolingian history and i mean carolingian history well and again, again, on the Carolingians, I will come on again <laughs> on the Carolingians. I will be I'm coming also on the Vikings, on other stuff. But the Carolingians will recur more often. Uh, so I thank you for listening. If you managed to to do it until this point, uh, you know, if I managed to entertain you up to this point, I'm flattered and proud of my work. I don't know, maybe you still think it's rubbish, but I, I, I don't know. Um, if you like this video, please share it, first of all, if you want. Um, otherwise, leave a like uh, or a comment or subscribe to my channel if you want to know more. And if you want a personalized video uh, about a certain topic, just know that if you make me a question, if you give me a suggestion about a certain topic, I can definitely uh, give you a video answer of that and uh, and and making this getting this channel started for real hmm? so I thank you very much for the attention once again and wish you a nice time bye.